technology to be able to interview people because I there I'm seeing interviews going all over the place. That- well, you know, I have I've been very careful not to do interviews because I went on Facebook and it was a video swamp, and I couldn't believe everybody that was broadcasting from their basement, and I I just thought, wow, you know, I'm going to wait. I'm going to keep writing, but I'm going to wait until the right moment. And uh, you and Robbie Dawkins were the two that I felt that I should, you know, say, yes, let's talk. Because um, it's an honor to be with you, by the way, my friend. I appreciate oh, it. Thank God for you. I'll tell you what, I can't tell you how many times I have your de- your book on my desk, which we're going to talk about, The Fire and Glory. And, uh, and I'll just look down and read a random statement, one statement. And it'll be like, America is a firewall that prevents the one event Satan craves most, global anarchy. Anarchy is the only thing that will make the world embrace Lucifer's worldwide dictatorship. That's why the most important goal of evil right now is chaos. And then you look at the suddenly that we're in yes, sir. Look. And, and the potential of chaos. And who, yes. who could have thought, which is why uh, everybody needs to get a hold of his books. It was a prophetic word. Um, on what's happening, really. It's defining what's happening. And you're even quoting Haggai in there, which which just helps confirm everything. So I could talk to you about a hundred different things. What's on your heart and your mind uppermost right now? Well, the, the first thing that's on my mind is we need sanity because the church is reacting to this virus every which way but loose. And uh, we they're... You know, the first thing I'd like to talk about is repentance, why it suddenly fell into disfavor. And, uh, you know, you would think, guy said, well, man, is this the judgment of God? I said, I don't, I don't want to go there. But what I do want to go is, is God is using it. And anyone who is not reflective, any ministry that is not self-evaluating, now that we're social distancing, What's, what are you doing with your time? Nothing, I think, exposes the heart more than the way this time is being used right now. If churches aren't saying, you know what, I went on TV and they asked me about gay marriage and they asked me about abortion and I gave them this hyperbolic, paraboloid, lateral arabesque answer instead of just saying my opinion doesn't matter, but here's the word of God. All of a sudden now, society needs... People that say, you know, I love you, but here is the truth. God's hand of protection was pushed away by what happened both inside the church and outside the church. And my question is not to say, well, is it the judgment of God? The question is, why aren't you evaluating? Why aren't you soberly saying? And if you stand up and and defend that it couldn't possibly God of, of love allow this, it just shows me where you're at, not the word of God. And and I think you have the same sense of urgency I do. Oh, I, I do. And I was listening to uh, the vice president because I know that he prays. He's got a prayer group uh, that prays. And the foundation prayer that he prays is from uh, Chronicles. If my people who are called by my name will humble himself and pray yeah. and, and uh, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and heal their land. So whenever he talks... He sends like a QAnon code message to believers. He says, we're working with this person, this person, and our goal is to heal our land. Right. And he's saying to the believer, right. pray the pray the chron- humble yourself and cry out to God. Yes, sir. I'm telling you, we need to heal the land. But I looked up the verse, Mario. And verse says, if I send a plague and my people... Uh, humble themselves. If it's so that it's if I send a plague is what comes in right front of that part I just quoted. Right. The plague is the incentive. So um, of course we know God doesn't send plagues except in the Bible. So the uh, I'm, and I'm reading I'm reading about the uh, prophecies that I've been listening to regarding Jim Lafoon. I think was quoted recently over here at Gateway and uh, Chuck Pierce. So I I, I of course. I love being Grand Central for all the prophetic because I believe God's speaking. And then I get, yes, sir. of course, the discouragement is uh, I'm also looking at the fact that we are more interested as Christians on who had a word about this and when they had it than 
what was God warning us about and why would he send something? You know what I mean? It's like we're asking the wrong question. You know, it's what like did I they know and this. when did they know it? <laughs> exactly. I was like, what is, I was with this genius once, Mark Marshall Levin, and he was showing me a photograph of the details of a computer chip and how it's literally a city within a city of circuitry all minutely connected together in an exquisite complexity like a chromosome welded with a thousand bits. And I'm looking at this marvel, and my question was, how in the world did they ever get the ability to take a picture of that? And he goes, take a picture? It's like the wrong question. It's how in the world did they do it, not how in the world did they get a picture of it. And I'm thinking, yeah, that was a dumb question. But that's us. We want to know who predicted it. And, and then yep. we want to know, how's it going to end with prayer? And it's always the same thing. We're going to pray, and we're going to take authority over it, and it's going to be a revival. It's like, yeah. wait a second. Is that what the message is? No, not at all. And, and we have to be aware of some of these men, like David Wilkerson, when they said these things, they were, they were uh, roundly rebuked and rejected for saying it. So I want to know what is the roundly rebuked prophetic word of this hour that's going against the grain of all these things. Oh. And, and you know, I'll tell you, you oh. think about when Esther, who had a good heart, is in the palace and she finds out that her cousin Mordecai is wearing sackcloth and ashes and she sends him clothes to wear and he refuses it. And what I call those are glad rags. So when she found out that Mordecai was grieving and sackcloth and ashes because of the genocide coming to the Jews, she said, put this on. These are the glad rags. And I'm watching it all over the American pulpit. They're trying to put glad rags on the coronavirus, and they're not at all getting. Now, in Matthew 24, and this I, I know because you're such a student of this, that this is, this is something Jesus said, not one building will be brick will be left on top of another on Jerusalem. And so they asked the wrong question. And a leader always answers the question that wasn't asked. That's their job. You answer the question that wasn't asked. And so they said to Jesus, when is this going to happen? The American public, the Christians are reacting to this, having been conditioned by Avenger movies. The dark hour is coming. You know, Iron Man lost his suit. Uh, Thor doesn't have his hand. Right. And we can't get the Hulk to oh turn God. green again. So here, the, the reaction of the audience is, we know it's going to be fine. It's going to turn out all right. That's only in movies. In this situation, there has to be a soberness about it. Now, you know, so Jesus answered and said, take heed that you're not deceived. Because the question you should ask is not, when is this going to happen? But are you spiritually evaluating your soul to know good from evil, truth from error in what's going on right now? And, and there's been a tremendous amount of flesh in the pulpit, even in spirit-filled churches. Horrendous amounts of flesh made up sermons, made up ideas, doctrines that were done for materialistic ulterior motives. And now it's all being revealed. And we got to get back to, you know, I tell the church, I'm going to drag you from Sesame Street back to Azusa Street is what I'm going to do. Because we have got to get that original fire and love for God. And so in a very real sense, if this is what what we believe it is, which is a singular event yes. that has literally created a solemn assembly worldwide, be yes. still and know that I am God. Yes. The, the the evening, uh, I look at, uh, you know, the evening where they show a city street silent from Paris to New York. Yeah. And it's like, be still and know that I am God. There's There's something in the atmosphere that is like Passover as we're heading into it where there's this sense of going out is more dangerous than staying in, and we're praying for something to literally pass over. 
but the yeah. challenge that I'm, I'm sensing that is that is most disconcerting is the people that I would have thought would have been the most receptive and perceptive are the ones that are the most embroiled in conspiracy themes and wacko scenarios. Um, exactly. You know, and I'm telling you, people, because, because and it's a virus in a sense that we're vulnerable to because we believe in the end times, we believe in the Antichrist, we believe in uh, the devil, we believe in the real potential of deep state. So when something like this happens, the instinct is, Lance, what do you think's behind it? Like everybody wants to know uh, was this done in a laboratory? Was, were, you know, was as one person said, they had a vision of Nancy Pelosi in a Wuhan laboratory. And I said, hold it, Nancy was not in the laboratory in Wuhan because they were they were advancing it seriously. I said, you understand that at best, that's symbolic of how Democrats will take advantage of this. But don't start telling people you think that uh, Nancy was cooking it up with the Chinese people. I said because. That puts us way into a ditch of the crazy zone. And, and so a, what is God saying? It's a distraction. It's a distraction from the urgency. You know, everybody should be saying, what does God want from us? What does he want from us right now? And and not have a right. preconceived notion of what that is. Well, look, look at Second Chronicles 7, 14. Let's just examine that for a second. If my people are called by my name. When a famous Christian singer does an interview and they ask him, uh, do you believe the Bible is the word of God? And they waffle. Well, then you have Psalms which says, I have exalted my word even above my name. So when you, when you uh, betray the word of God, you're, you're literally saying, I don't want to be called by your name. And then the Bible says, humble themselves. That's what I'm looking for is some humility right now. I'm looking yeah. for a mega church pastor to get in his pulpit and say, you know what? I really haven't been giving you enough of the word of God. I have not been calling you to true discipleship like I should have. I've been too enamored with marketing. I've been too enamored by looking. And, you know, Jeremiah said, woe unto those prophets that steal my words from each other. When everybody sounds the same, everybody acts the same, everybody has the same inflection. Then you know they're looking at what this dude said over here at this mega church because if I say it, I'm going to get the same results he is. And God is saying, you better get back to me and only speak what I tell you. Like Micaiah in 1 Kings 22. Only what God tells me will I speak. Only what God tells me. And so they say, if you're called by my, God said, if you call by my name, that means when you're in the news media, you tell the truth. If you humble yourself, that means you're not trying to be a celebrity. You're trying to be a servant for God and, and turn from their wicked ways. The thing that I want to do is encourage the righteous. That's what I want to do, Lance. I want to encourage the righteous to understand their prayers have the power of God. You know, the Bible says in number 16, it says that Moses and Aaron ran between God and the plague. And with the censor, they they uh, they 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 stopped it, and uh, you know when God said, "Look, if I find twelve righteous people, I would save Sodom." I think the righteous core, as much right. as I want to, you know, correct a certain element of the body, I want to exalt another segment. Your prayers have more power than you can possibly understand right now. But the key is revival. The key is moral awakening. Well, I'm going to put the uh, camera on you for a second. You are now okay. talking to the 100,000. Talk, give them, share with them how they can maximize this time right now that God's given them so that they could position themselves to really hear what God wants to say to them to order their lives. I truly believe that there is a breed of Christian God is raising up. It's found in 2 Timothy 20. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. In a great house, there's not just vessels of honor, but vessels of dishonor. You know, there are turkeys and there are eagles in the body of Christ right now. And the Bible says, if one separate himself from these, well, that word these is talking about the vessels of dishonor. 
You know the ones that are drunk, that are hooked on pornography, that have all along taught a licentious version of Christianity. And you know that you don't feel the presence of God. And the Lord said, separate yourself. Well, now the government and a virus has afforded us the greatest opportunity we've ever had to get alone with God. And for you that love the Lord, this is a moment of equipping, empowering, clarification of deliverance from habits of resetting your entire sense of direction. God is going to bring America to a Christian rediscovery. And it won't be the brand that we look at like McDonald's or some cheap version. It will be the living word. Now, somebody says, if we live that way, Mario, if we actually live that way, the way Jesus said to, it's going to be hard. People are not going to be attracted to it. You couldn't be more incorrect. The single most contagious person on earth is full of Christ. Because of them, we don't need marketing. Because of them, we don't need perks. Because of them, we don't need ulterior motives for becoming a Christian. The joy of the Lord, the peace of the Lord, the power of the Lord inside of an individual, the, the Christian that we need in this hour. And here's what I'm going to finish because I don't want to take too long and abuse this privilege. If we know their vessels on honor and dishonor, the idea of a culture of honor must be balanced out with a culture of dishonor. Because I'm not the one who said it. The word of God said it. Some to honor, some to dishonor. And we need to quit funding and being fan base for ministries that are carnal and wrong. And you need to discern that. And you need not to let the little bitty uh, thrill you get from them overwhelm you from understanding from the word of God what is really true. Second is separate yourself. Well, that's it. That's where we are right now, already separated. God did not separate you to punish you, but to empower you and equip you and to give you the greatest gift of all. His presence is going to be with you in a way you never imagined. The third said, and anyone that pays this price of separation, they will be a vessel unto honor, a vessel of fire and glory. And, and it says meet, meet for every good use. This means special ops. Right now, we're in a weird situation. Well, God has a unique person for this weird situation, and it just might be you. God gives us the power to more than meet the challenge of complicated cultural junctures like the one we're in. God will empower you. God will anoint you. God will turn your church into a glory center. If you're a pastor, don't be yearning to restart the engines of your empire. Look at this as maybe deliverance from going and becoming good at something you're not supposed to be doing. Let your church be a revival center of the presence, power, and the preaching of the word of God. If that costs you people, understand this. For every disgruntled saint, saint that leaves because of their cardinality, God will send 10 true disciples that will make the church even more contagious. Thank you. Glory to God. And, and that's, really, uh, that's really what I want to say right now. And I'm looking for my friend Lance now. And, you know, uh, while I'm at it, I do want to say this, and I think everyone needs to understand that God's not stopped being loving, a healer, and powerful. But claiming those promises of God in 2 uh, Chronicles seven fourteen, the issue became those who are called by my name. If you have been ashamed to say you're a Christian in the workplace, if you've been ashamed in the pulpit to tell people the, the, the real requirement of serving Christ, thinking that you can be saved on the installment plan, you get Savior and then Lord. You don't, you, you, can't, uh, you can't divide those. And lastly, singularly, that those of you that are celebrities, that have influence in culture, that have been told, oh, if you stand for Christ, you're going to lose your Hollywood career. Or if so you invent this subtlety, this approach that you feel isn't compromising. But the fact is, 
when you are directly confronted with the question, we have not answered it like we should. And we have asked God to leave our courts. We've asked him to leave our schools. We've asked him to leave all of what we are. And we need singularly, and I use that word because I, I mean that, you have to know what you should be doing right now. And this is valuable time. And I hear so much of Christians saying they're, they're binge watching their favorite show. They're watching all kinds of movies. And I wonder right now, isn't this a powerful time to absorb the power of God? Because you're going to be prepared for the reconstruction of the United States, of bringing it back from what it was during this virus to something new. And there's a lot I don't want us to go back to. There's a lot. Our, our inability to push back on the immorality in this country is well documented. And it's time. It's time for something new. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, uh, I, I am so honored for this time. I'm very humbled by it. And I don't want anyone to think that I'm this judgmental uh, prophetic voice. I'm not. I'm a soul winner. I'd rather be in a tent uh, preaching to the lost and getting sick people healed. This is, you know, that's really powerful. I had to. And it's like the devil wanted to attack while you were while you were preaching. I said, "Let let the broadcast go." And so I'm kind of dropped off. This is like Aruba. I just we did this in Aruba. And I know. I, I was joking with you, and I said, "Now in Aruba, I lost all the uh, Wi-Fi, but you know, thank God you were there to talk to people." So I love what you were saying. <laughs> I was trying to figure out what was happening. So well, you, you know, you're perfect to work with in these situations. So I heard, but I was listening. I had the audio on, and I didn't want to interrupt it because this is this is this is a great time for people to be able to examine where they're at and what they're doing. And your book, I think, would be a powerful. It's a short book, really. It's like 130 some pages, and uh, I, I just read you. I just read to folks parts of this because I have I have it marked up so vastly. It is left to the apostles. Pro oh, this is the quote that I kind of liked uh, when I first ran across you over a year and a half ago. No one's better equipped to break the curse that is on America than the church. Conservatives can only do so much. Right. Your favorite commentator can only do so much. It's Ben Shapiro, or whether it's like Rush or Jordan Peterson, they can only accomplish part. It's left to the apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and evangelists to take up the mantle for this hour. But to our great horror, instead of purifying themselves for the battle of their lives, instead of seeking holy fire to combat the evil, many are gorging on cheap grace, testing the limits of decency and falling into dangerous addictions. And so um, then you were talking about the quote from Haggai. The, uh, the Haggai, the prophet, asked the painful question, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your panel house? And this house lies in ruins. I really think that a lot of pastors and preachers and Christians would be willing to make their house or their church their priority, and that's half the problem anyway. They have made that their priority. I'm beginning to think that the scandalous prophetic word of the hour is that we have neglected the house of America, which is the nation, and that we've been building our own house, uh, and that just like in Haggai, where the prophet came and said, did you notice how I took all the money you made and put it in a bag with a hole in it? Did you notice that three years wow. of the greatest economic gain America ever had just got blown away in two weeks? Wow. Consider your ways. And the problem was that people didn't think it was time to get involved with God's agenda because there was too much opposition. It was easier to build their own house than it was to do his building project. I think America is God's building project. Yes, sir. You know, and... This is a host nation. We survive for three reasons. We stand with Israel. We preach the gospel to the world and we feed the poor. And the Lord, the Lord has singularly allowed us, defended us and blessed us. And the story from George Washington and, and uh, until now is a story of intervention we didn't deserve. Now, I am convinced that the most important thing to discover 
is that when Jonah was in the boat and that storm was raging, that every man prayed to his own deity. It was like an international test of which is the truth. And Jonah's sleeping. And the captain says, who are you? Why aren't you praying to your God like everybody else is? We got Krishna over here. We got Islam over here. We got House of Oprah over here. And uh, where are you? And he said, well, I'm a, I'm a rebel. I'm rebelling against God because I was told, and this storm was caused by me disobeying God. Well, the Christian body of Christ in America has a singular relationship with the welfare of the United States. And those men started rebuking Jonah. They looked at Jonah and said, how dare you endangering us? And, and the wording is perfect in Hebrew. How dare you endanger us by disobeying God and getting out of the will of God? Well, I think that finger can be pointed at the church. Why did you endanger us? by being seduced with the need for competing with yourselves, having the biggest church, having all the trinkets and toys of the age, and didn't speak to it. You know, I used to preach against drugs. I used to preach, I still do. I pre preached against all the drugs because I was on the streets working with the gangsters. Uh, I would preach against gang violence. You know, when I preached against drugs all the time. Nobody accused me of being a pharmacist. When I turned around and began to describe the sin of America, including abortion, the natural marriage, everything else, then they said I was a politician. But I said, no, I'm, I have not changed one iota of my message. I now believe the worst gang in the inner city is the leftist atheism and socialism. I now believe the worst drug is dependency on government. And we needed to be a voice against the evil. Hallelujah. And we needed to be. And My God. And I just have one more thing I want to say about, you know, in Luke 21, uh, Lance, it says, God will give us a mouth and wisdom that no man can gainsay nor resist. So we took 1 Corinthians 2 and made it a universal application. The immorality in Corinth was so great that there was no debate that could be had. You could not reason with the Corinthian. They were immoral. What they needed was an encounter with the power of God. And that's it. When I, when I deal with heroin addicts, I'm not going to give them a three-point defense of American history and why the Bible is the word of God. No, I got to get them filled with the spirit and cast the devil out of them. But then when Paul went to uh, and the other city in Acts 14, it said they spoke with such effectiveness that many were saved. Mm. So there's there's this this theory that uh, when I came to you, I didn't come with the excellency of man's wisdom, preaching to you the counsel of God, for I determined not to know anything among you except Christ and him crucified. And then Jesus said, I will give you a mouth and wisdom that no man can gainsay nor resist. God is waiting for the kind of preacher like Finney that will stand up and by the love of God, tear the shreds off of modern philosophy. Now, this is what the Bible says in the Amplified Version, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4, verse 5 says, destroying every sophisticated argument against the knowledge of God. This is what we can do right now. Right now, I, I would love to be on a talk show and say, listen, let me tell you why Christianity is your best move. Why after 50 years of preaching and leading tens of thousands to Christ, I have never met one individual who ever came back to me and said, that was the worst move I ever made. It was a mistake to give myself to Christ. They say this, it changed everything. It empowered everything. It made everything make sense. And right now, it's like the church is put its worst foot forward at the most inconvenient moment. We have the best thing America could ever hear, and we're ashamed of it. I, I you know, and I believe, and not everyone, because like I believe there are millions of Christians that right now, and even God could use this uh, vehicle today to in, generate something supernatural. I'm going to say one last thing, and I'm trying. <laughs> I got to tell you, Here's what wrecked me, Lance. I was in the Jesus movement. I was in the Jesus movement. 
I saw God sovereignly save thousands of young people. In California, we had baptismal services with 10,000 people at a time. In California, we saw every man, woman, boy, and girl receive a direct witness to receive Christ. It was not general. It was not just general. It was specific. I watched the fish mm. jumping into the boat. I believe after this coronavirus, it's possible that revival will come. But repentance to the bone is absolutely essential in this hour. Well, Self-evaluation is the key. Right I, I agree. And I think that whole verse, it says, you know, if any man would judge himself, he shall not be judged, to, which was Paul was teaching at communion. As often as you drink this, let a man judge himself. I think the judgment, self-judgment, is a daily phenomena. Yes, sir. And it's not, it's not some kind of an oddity and some kind of a – it's a daily phenomena. And, uh, and the opportunities to humble yourself is as simple as any day having to apologize for some bonehead thing. I said to my wife that I, the Lord says, go wow. tell you're sorry. I mean, at, any husband who's married for 30 years or knows what it's like to <laughs> repent. So it's not like it's an alien act. And I, yeah. think, I think that that uh, I was talking earlier about the I, I'd heard uh, from the gateway here. They were preaching it. And then Jim Lathun's name came up and he talked about uh, 17. So within 17 months, this was last year, the New Year's Eve service or 2018, that the New York Stock Exchange was going to be in a free fall. And then California was going to be up in the air, tossed up. And he saw the hands of the Lord come out and catch the earth. And uh, the, the thing that he said was that he asked the Lord about it, and the Lord showed him Aaron and the verse you're talking about with going out with the censer because, yes, get this, a plague had broken out among the people. Right. And so Aaron went out as a royal priesthood. He didn't stay in quarantine in the sanctuary. That's where he was. He went out among the plague people. And he distributed the incense, which Paul would say, yeah. we are the incense of Christ, of life to those that live, and of death to those that, you know, insist on dying. Yes. That incense arrested the plague. But I, just like if my people that are called by my name, we all get that. And then I look one verse back and it says, and if a plague hits and my people repent, it was what my question was, what was the cause of the plague that Aaron had to deal with? And it was strife in the camp against God-appointed leadership. Exactly. I believe that America's, it's, it's, it's strife, and particularly if you look at the Rose Garden, I mean, Christians kind of compartmentalize themselves. I originated Seven Mountains just because I realized there's more than one compartment that we live in, but that they all are part of the kingdom. But you go to the Rose Garden, it is like watching uh, you know, a pack of wolves descend. It's like White Fang. It's like, you know, he has to, Trump is having to, CNN, Jim Acosta, has got, you know, this, yeah, it's, not gonna, yeah. it's bizarre. And I'm saying it's the, these, this, the poison of venom is under their tongue. Is yes, the problem. Yes. Psalm is it. These guys are so wired to like, you know, the tongue, you know, kindleth a fire and it's a little member, but it kindleth and it's set on fire by hell. There are people that are wired to ideas and to dispositions that they use their mouth to authorize into manifestation. And then we run into the authority of anointed yes. leadership. And I honestly believe right now, part of the problem is the plague of strife and the, um, and the disengagement of the church. And a lot of us call it, you know, you know, that we're, they're seeking peace or something. They're not, they're pacifists. There's a big difference between being a man of peace and being a pacifist. Right. The man of peace goes where the war zone is and yes. trying to bring reconciliation. The pastor yes. just refuses to get involved. You know, the police are called peace officers. Huh. There it is. Why are they called peace officers? Why is it, uh, you know, that they're authorized to sustain the peace? And, and this, the, you know, this mellow, this, this absolutely, uh, you know, I, I don't know how to use the right word without getting in trouble here. But one of the things is that the body of Christ has got to learn that truth does not swing on a pendulum. This is very important. The theological idea that once a doctrine has been neglected, an overdose of it will generally lead to balance. It's not true. The plumb line is the truth. See, when I started first hearing your uh, teaching, 
and watching your program, I noted, I said to my wife, I said, Lance is a plumb line. And what does a plumb line do? A plumb line doesn't really join a camp because the only way a plumb line can work is if it hangs free. Hmm. And when a plumb line drops in a room, it has separate and unique judgment for every corner of that room. If one room is leaning too far to the right, it says you need to come to plumb over here. If your ground is too low, you need to raise it up. And, and this is what the church wants. They think the American obsession is if a little is good, a lot is better. And the Bible talks about rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, we're at a point where we don't need an overdose of the prophetic to make up for the absence of the prophetic. We don't need an overdose of healing because we've ignored it. We need to rightly divide the word of truth. Right now, this is a moment where an injection of sanity is so critical. That's why I feel felt that I could trust your spirit. And I'm just saying this, you know, I don't flatter, but I'll tell you, I could trust your spirit because I would watch you agree with the truth and then disagree with the over-application of that truth. Then that showed me, you know what we're trying to do here? We're not trying to sell anything. We're not trying to garner popularity. We're trying to give you folks that are watching right now the one thing that will secure you that will take you from this virus to safety, that will take you from dangerous false doctrine to the truth. And we don't want the shortcut. We don't want the cheap shot. And I'm afraid that right now there are ministries that God is going to expose because they have literally uncoupled themselves from the Holy Spirit's dependency and the Bible. That's why I believe rightly dividing the word right now is essential to all of us. I, I, I think you're right. And I, and I think that, uh, and that goes to why the conspiracy stuff is, is, is in evidence of yes. a problem that yep. will really become, uh, you know, in a sense, spectators, almost right. like, it's like a friend of mine, this is hilarious in a way, but a friend of mine uh, has woke up the other night, his wife was praying in tongues, interceding for a character on Downton Abbey. <laughs> she was watching so much of it, binge watching, that it was in her subconscious. She's praying for a TV person in a script. <laughs> and I think that, uh, so so I think the Christian, I should say, she wasn't praying in tongues. She was praying for, it could be praying in tongues for the person. That would have been accurate. She was praying for a, because the husband woke up and said, my God, she's interceding for someone in Downton Abbey. But what's happened is we don't know. We're caught up in 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 stories instead yeah. of what God is saying. And the proof of that is, and I'm just going to say it, that everyone is talking about the 5G tower. You got, I'm going to lose people all the time and get mad at me. There's an interesting study by Height, the um, the psychologist, and, and it was that if you ever commit yourself to an opinion in print or on Twitter, you are uh, – 50% more resistant to truth afterward correcting it, which means wow. once your ego has made a commitment in writing and, or verbally in front of others and you're in error, it is statistically harder to backtrack in the presence of truth because the inclination of the human nature is to seek out new justification for why you're right. It's confirmation bias. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And that's what's happened in the body of Christ. They're filtering out the parts of the Bible that discredit their imbalance because they want to focus only on those that tend to confirm their, their theory or their viewpoint. And that's, that's, really, uh, that's really a danger right now. And the most important thing is, is like uh, take our friend that was praying for the character in the TV show, video neurosis. What is reality? What is deep video? And now suddenly the body of Christ is, is concerned about things that are irrelevant and totally unconcerned about things that are absolutely urgent. You have, by the way, everyone needs to read your blog. You say things better than anyone I know. Uh, we've got MarioMarilla.org. They can get your um, blog if they sign up there. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. And, Absolutely, and I don't want to lose sight of this, but I'm telling you guys, you all need to join me in reading. Not, it's not a, it's not a very, it's not a big book, but it's, it's a, it's like a very powerful book for this exactly. moment in history, and it's the, the fire and glory. They could get that on your website too, right? Yes, autographed. 
Oh and my you know God! Why, you know why I autographed it? Yeah, you're not going gimmick. anywhere this week. You can autograph it. A gimmick. <laughs> I, 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 let me read to you something from Charles Finney just while we're on this, and uh, yes, sir. I know nobody is really has to go anywhere, so just stay with us. Charles Finney said, according to your book here, no man can possibly be benevolent or religious to the full extent of his obligations without concerning himself to a greater or lesser extent with the affairs of human government. Let me Absolutely. say something. I believe, and I told you this before, that I, I believe there's a Billy Graham moment that is coming to the United States. It was in, it was, Billy Graham was laid out in his coffin and marched up and, and, and displayed in the nation's capital. And during the Feast of Purim, it was uh, like two years ago, it was on the feast day in February that Billy Graham was laid there and all of the dignitaries had to do homage, whether they were, whether they like evangelicals or not, they had, they, it was important for Pelosi and Schumer to show, I can't see them doing that for Rick Warren or anybody or Franklin, no. but they had to do it for Billy Graham because Billy Graham was symbolic. He had brand equity of a different sort. 99 yes. years old. He had been praying for America after he was preaching and, um, wow. and he, and he, in his, and as he laid there, it technically wasn't in state, but it was in view at the nation's capital on the Feast of Purim. My friend, the Feast of Purim was the feast where the Jews were targeted for execution by a deep state coup to eliminate their voice in government. Exactly. And the intercession and positioning of influencers such as Mordecai and Esther were able to turn the situation so yes. that they could arm themselves against yes. their own annihilation. Yes. Billy Graham delivered a prophecy from his coffin, and it was the Billy Graham prophecy in the Feast of Purim as he was in the nation's capital on that day. Wow. Donald Trump went up and tapped the coffin five times. Wow. And in an unrehearsed moment, he tapped it five times, and I'm thinking fivefold ministry, and he said, May God raise up a new generation of multiple Billy Grahams, male and female. He was calling forth as a Solomon, yeah. as a king, for the yeah. intercession and was tapping the coffin saying, May yeah. the grace of God, five, grace, yeah. raise up a fivefold manifestation of this man's life in wow. the next generation. I believe you've got that grace on, and I'll tell you why. I, I listen for this because I don't believe that it's going to be dispersed on someone who is simply a signs and wonders evangelist, as great as that is, or someone who has a, a fidelity to the word of God, like a good teacher preacher. Billy Graham emerged and had the uh, mantle for the nation because he came out of World War II. And from 1948 to 1965, yeah. the peak years of Billy Graham, it was his obsession with the threat of agnostic communism and the devil wanting to destroy America and America needing to repent or that yeah. communism and, and, yeah. and atheism was going to take over the land. And in his early days, the spiritual warfare was so intense, he felt like he would be assassinated while preaching. Yeah. He did. And he had, he had the American flag and it was, yeah. he had what today they will accuse someone of being a Christian nationalist, like some kind of a Nazi person who actually loves America and dares to yeah. merge two ideas together. And that oh, is that wow. God actually can have his influence on nations and that there is a nobler purpose to nations than just their existence and Christ yeah. can claim a portion of it. And yeah. I believe because you do it instinctively, you go there. And you talk about like the dangerous drug that is dependence on government and and surrendering all responsibility or uh, allowing a worldview that says, I don't know if I'm a male or female, if I'm an amoeba, where yeah. I came from. And, and so this this kind of thinking has actually produced a generation of people, of young people that are so disoriented and desperate that it would take a moment like this in history to have them saying, wait a second, you mean there's no easy answer? Science doesn't show up right away and solve my problem? There's no app for this? No. Yeah. And it's like, it doesn't come quick? Wow. And my life could be threatened? And wow. I can't touch people? I, I'm so sure. Think about this. God is saying since, since you guys, I'll say he's doing it for America. Since you guys don't know what a plague is, 
Uh, it's the plague of the ideas you've allowed to get into your yeah. children that have screwed up their identity, their yeah. gender, their purity, their direction, yeah. and pretty soon their prosperity and their freedom. Because yeah. you don't know what a virus looks like. How about we put one out there so you can see? And suddenly people are, they're all worried about touching each other. In Haggai, the second chapter of that prophet that goes down in the era of yes. Scott and says, hey, what just happened to your economy? Why did that happen? Maybe it's because you're not doing what I want you to do. The, yep. th that same prophet said, you ever notice how it is that that uh, if you touch a dead body, do you make it clean or does it mess you up? What happens? He said, according to the Jewish law, that which is defiled contaminates. Virtue doesn't pass as easily as contamination passes. Right. So let me, say, cool. let, let me give this one quote. If there is the decay of conscience, Finney said, the pulpit is responsible. If right. the public press or the New York Times lacks moral discernment, the pulpit is responsible. If the church is degenerate and worldly, the pulpit is responsible. If the world loses its interest in Christ and Christianity, the pulpit is responsible. If Satan rules in the halls of our legislature, the pulpit is responsible. If our politics become so corrupt that the very foundations of our government are ready to fall apart, the pulpit is responsible. He's literally saying the man of God, the woman of God with the anointing and the word of God has an obligation from God to affect all those domains and not simply to be talking about the world to come and building their buildings. Wow. <laughs> that was explosive. That was uh, nuclear. You know, you wrote it. <laughs> well, no, your, your comments about Billy Graham, one of the reasons that Billy Graham ended up in the rotunda with the respect and admiration. And when I went to the Billy Graham library, it rocked my world entirely is that from the jump, he made his positions clear to everyone. This is what I believe. I believe I have a picture of the LA Coliseum, 134,000 people, <coughs> excuse me, 134,000 people came to the LA Coliseum and on the reader board, it said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Not one person was there under false pretense. Not one person was fooled in there. There was no contest. There was no fog machine. There was nothing but a man standing with the Bible. Now, I believe that the resentment, this is interesting, the resentment that people have toward modern preachers is that they instinctively sense that they are betraying their own belief systems. They feel it, the insincerity of it. No matter how much you smile, you know, it is interesting. The, the model, the seeker model was created to get the world to like us. The world liked us better under Billy Graham than under the seeker model. Before all of these designer churches, the, the world understood that when you went to the house of God, you were going to hear the word of God. You were going to be told you needed to change. You weren't there to feel good, but to become good. And that, I believe, is ultimately where influence and strength comes from. I, I, I agree. You're right. And, and what came to me earlier, and I can hardly believe it, it's already almost an hour, uh, 50 minutes we've been talking. But the uh, when Jesus, I think we have a mistaken idea that if we can pray the right way and have a revival, an awakening, a visitation, a harvest, like I'm even hearing the preachers that are that are taking this moment, and here's where they jump to. They they jump to, all right, this is a, like a scary situation. And I'm not saying if God sent it. I don't believe God sent it, but it's here, and God's the one who's going to fix it. But if America doesn't, um, doesn't if the church doesn't rise up and address this thing right now, right. This could, this could really take us apart, take us into a Great Depression. Absolutely right. true. And, uh, but I believe that the church is going to rise up. We're going to pray. Yes. And the plague is going to prevent so-and-so prophesied that it's going to end in the Passover. And then it's kind of like it's like the Downton Abbey prayer. thing. It's like that's our story. And then, woo, we're going to have our revival, and America's going to have an awakening. Well, not so fast, Hashimoto. Maybe that's yeah. not exactly how that works. <laughs> Maybe if uh, things go back to normal, I already know where the left is going. Because yeah. because what the knucklehead out there in California, Adam Schiff, is ready for another investigation. Oh, boy, this is like a script out of a movie. 
I don't know, we're going to have an, it's going to be an investigation of whether Trump knew what he was doing and how soon did he know about the, this plague and how it's the, it's, if, if we go back to normal and the engines of the recovery kick back in and we go back into the political cycle, I fear for America because the whole purpose of, of you know, of, of uh, that chapter one and chapter two of Haggai was to arrest God's people and say, right. what are you building? And I'm saying we've yeah, got to get doing? involved with the nation's right. project. And even if we have a really ugly conversation about politics, let's have it because it's like uh, the elephant in the room anyway. We might yeah, have talked about it because it's it's the battle we're in. And the future of America is going to be just like I tell people, they go, well, I'm rather well now. I don't believe the Lord's calling me to get involved with politics. I said, well, let's go back in history. And let's say that you were alive during the time of Lincoln. Would you have been on the side of the North or would you have been neutral or on the side of the South? Well, that's awkward because history would condemn their neutrality or their yeah, of with the South. Well, I would have been on the side of the North. Well, so that kind of tells me that you would have to take a position. And so what position are you taking now? Or don't you think we're in a cultural civil war and the nation's in danger of falling apart or being judged? It's like, come on, this we yeah. have to have that kind. Preachers don't want to have it, Mario. We yeah. got. That's why the people watching this share this broadcast because yes. we gotta. We have to create the ecosphere. Yes, we do. All uh, incendiary influence we have to put the pressure on the leaders to have the conversation they don't want to have. They don't want to have it. What is God saying, and and what's the way out of the mess we're in in terms of surrendering culture and the mechanisms of culture? to the forces that are not under the influence of the body of Christ. I'm going to tell you something I did in California real fast, Lance. I walked into a packed out church. We were getting ready for one of our 10 crusades. We were having a prayer rally. You couldn't get near the building. We had to borrow 200 chairs from a church across the street. And we got everyone in and the Holy Spirit said, obey me. So I stood there and I said, I want to see the hands of all of you in this room that had a child suspended from school for wearing a Christian t-shirt, raise your hand, hands went up. I said, I wanna see the hands of those of you that were threatened on the, in the workplace because you shared your faith, raise your hand. How many of you in this room have been fired because you took a stand for Christ or someone used something you said on social media to terminate your position in a high level corporation? And the hands went up. Wow. And then I looked at at least 40 pastors that were in the room. And I said, what are you doing to address this attack on the sheep of God? Wow. And number two, what are you doing to equip the sheep of God to stand against this? If you won't stand and, and if you won't study what uh, leftism is doing, if you won't uh, educate yourself, on the lies that are being told and the violations of the constitution and an understanding of your rights as a local church. How you, you, I said, you're preaching to all the things that none of your people are going through and you're ignoring all of the things they are going through. And I had a guy come up to me, pastor, and he said, uh, and there are many godly pastors, there are thousands of great men and women of God in the American pulpit. And I thank God for every one of them. This guy came up to me and said, you're nothing but a politician. So I looked at him and I said, uh, why do you say that? He said, well, you preach on nothing but politics. I said, I preach on nothing but truth. And if politics gets in the way, it's going to get hit. And then I said, uh, but let me ask you a question. Why aren't you taking a stand against abortion? Why aren't you standing for traditional marriage in your pulpit? He said, well, I would lose tithers. I said, you mean votes? I said, you're the politician, not me. And that's what a politician does. It avoids a declaration of truth that could cost them an election. And I believe that no one has the right to look at you or me and call us uh, inappropriately involved in politics. They are inappropriately involved in politics because their motive is to keep their power just like the swamp in Washington keep their influence, keep their livelihood, and rather than to speak the truth of the word of God. You're a absolutely right. They have, they have, and, and right now they are inappropriately extending their domain into the church. 
Right. And so they, they just walked into my kitchen. And, I, and so that, that's, that's where we're at. Let me, let me, let me uh, throw out one idea to, to, to bring closure to this right now. We want to pray for folks. I think that believers need to know that there is no way that Jesus in the Bible uh, could avoid provoking his enemies by being more loving in what he did. I want people to think about this. Because no. There's a there's yeah. a subtle proposition that is an error in the minds of Christians that says that if we had more of if we had signs and wonders and preach the gospel and lift up Christ that somehow we will avoid the needless um, uh, agitation and criticism that uh, comes on the church and the persecution which is self inflicted. But here's the reality. While you were talking, and the Lord showed me this, you were talking about this, and I knew I had to say it. When Jesus was uh, in uh, Capernaum, I think it was, and the man was there with like a withered hand, uh, and he tells him to stretch forth his hand. Yes. The Bible says you get a, you get a manifestation of a supernatural healing, and you would think it would convert the naysayer into, well, exactly. wait a second. This is not so bad. The truth is they went out and commiserated how they would kill him because yeah. the moment the church gets to the point that it starts to prevail in its message, it will not cause its enemies to reconsider the supernatural argument in favor of their proposition. It will make them incensed with how we have to stop them and, and lock them up for hate speech or kill them off and discourage them. In other words, revival isn't going to be a, uh, or intercession isn't going to be an end run around persecution. There it is. It's going to happen if we're successful because Jesus yes, had it and he did it perfect. Yes, he did. You know, uh, when you, if you want to understand the hatred of guys like Trump, it's in the book of uh, the story of Lazarus. I didn't know this. And uh, in it, after Lazarus was raised from the dead, the power, the crime families, because I'm talking to a New Yorker. He knows exactly what I'm talking about. The five heads of the crime families sat down and said, do you realize what just happened? This man was raised from the dead. And if we don't stop them, they said two things. They're going to take away our nation and our place. And the interesting thing is, is that people have a right to look at Washington and say, you know what? Uh, politicians are just trying to save their place, even when they know truth. But there are preachers, some who are watching right now, that even in the face of incontrovertible truth and a supernatural miracle, you will still take steps to protect yourself from your occupation being threatened by revival. And think of what that says. Think of what that means. That is an indictment beyond words. And I, and I don't want to go to meet Jesus and find it's out that that was my condition, and I could have figured it out if I had just been a little more introspective. Yes. So I was talking to my daughter last night about, uh, and she asked a great question. She's uh, graduating this year from college, and they're the kind, she's the child that asks the questions that make you think after the conversation about what she asked and whether or not there isn't a deeper answer. And it's like the Lord asked the question. So she was asking about why it is that people – Christians are against, like, a, you know, she should listen to a little bit of Mark Levin. She said, why are there Christians that are against, if you have a word from the Lord, why aren't they, why aren't people supporting it? Why do they divide so much? And I said, there's a verse in 3 John, and it, this is the Apostle John. You would think, wow. Mario, that somebody of the stature of one of the 12 who had Jesus, who had his head on the breast of the Messiah at the Last Supper, that and whose mother lived with him, you would right. think he would have a peculiar kind of uh, prestige in the first century church. But he writes, he goes, I want to come down and talk to you, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence, is talking <laughs> against us, and i got to deal with this thing first. And I think this is called the spirit of Diotrephes. It's, it's the preacher yes. who has such an addiction to being the smartest guy or the most profound or the most prophetic or the most yes. anointed that when they encounter truth, instead of celebrating it as Jesus just manifested, get near it, 
They yes. compete with it because it's yes. taking the attention away from them. And uh, yes. and that's I think I think the true the true messenger of the Lord, the burden of the Lord, the messenger knows it's not popular. So they recognize already it's a burden to have that message because he ain't going to make you the most popular guy in the room. And that's, no, that's uh, evidence that maybe like what was it you said in the beginning yeah. earlier about social distancing or whatever. Uh, but uh, there's a word you use. But the, the true word of the Lord is going to create an alienation. Well, of course it is. And, you know, uh, signs and wonders. There's, here's what we're getting wrong about signs and wonders. Signs and wonders is what Paul kept Paul going in the face of controversial preaching. It's what kept him going. And it, it says in Acts 14, and God approved of their preaching by giving them the power to work miracles. So what happens is we, we want miracles without a controversial message. We want a non-divisive uh, message with miracles. We don't understand that. If you really want signs and wonders to occur in your meeting, start preaching the heart of God for the hour you're living in. Because you're not giving God anything to confirm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, you're not giving him anything to confirm. And it said God worked with them, confirming the word, the signs following. And, uh, and I tell you. I, uh, love, I love this so much. One random thought. This is an ADD uh, br um, brain right now. But the I have to say this because you made me think about it. Everyone needs to look at what what they were preaching and what was being talked about before everything was shut down and we're right now struggling to keep ourselves out of a Great Depression. Yes. And here's what comes to mind. I was in Hawaii at a management, a leadership seminar when 9-11 happened. So yes. I was in Hawaii and the people I was with were actually from the World Trade Center. They left to go to this seminar, oh. and they're watching their coworkers, and they're oh. watching some of them, the girl they're engaged to, or the guy is there in that building. And it was like, it was shocking. And I, what, what struck me most is what was the dominant conversation in America before real history showed up? They were talking about Chandra Levy, the missing intern of a congressman in California who was jogging in a park, and they were trying to create a story that it was Congressman Gary Collin or whatever with Chandra Levy, the intern, jogging and not and, and killed. And so that so what you find out is that was fake news and right. that was not real news. And then 9-11 right. happens and you find out what real news is because nobody went back to Chandra Levy. And the church probably is guilty of preaching fake messages because yeah. a lot of it is Chandra Levy stuff. It's yeah. about how to do this and then this and that and and it, and, and trivializing the hour we're about to go into should have been in the atmosphere, a sense of divine foreboding and pre preparation for the moment we're in. That should have been on the lips of the preachers as opposed Absolutely. to the whole series that got interrupted. Right. And, and why, uh, why didn't they get it? Why didn't they get the memo that this was coming? Because they had an agenda. They had a private need to defend and, and advocate for a, a whole other thing. You know, uh, I can't even imagine going back now uh, how it will look, Lance, if they go back to this. Uh, light and airy Christianity after this. I, it's going to look silly. It's going to look ridiculous. Yeah, I don't now, know. And this is, a, this is an incredible hour right now. It is, my brother. And we have to have more conversations uh, like this, and we, we, we certainly have the opportunity. Uh, would you, would you uh, let's, let's just have a word of prayer. There are people out there that need healing. They've been yeah. listening to the word of the Lord. There are some that are out there. Unfortunately, they're traumatized because they're listening to the they're listening to pandemic news media, and so they, so let's pray the shalom of God, the healing of God over the over the people. And what I'm praying, you guys share this broadcast. We've had unusual broadcasts. They're actually going 150, some 200,000. I one close to a million, and it's not as you can see, it's not high tech. I'm falling apart here with my with my uh, computer. But it's just uh, the privilege of people are actually looking for a voice 
And I'm so glad that you, you were elected to be on this platform and to speak for our group. So would you please pray for us, brother? Lord, everything that Lance just said, I bring to your presence that there are people that need healing. There are people that need comfort, others that need correction. But everyone's need, Lord, is very clear and obvious to you. The one thing that we will not be gripped by is fear, because we know that you told us not to be afraid. You said that we are to fear not. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. We believe in you, Jesus. We believe in your power over this circumstance. We pray that the healing virtue of Christ will flow like a mighty river throughout this region and this nation and this world. Lord, these hospitals need a miracle. We need something that will demonstrate the mercy and the goodness of God in the land of the living. Wake up your vessels, Lord. Wake them up from foolishness and bring them back to supernatural balance and the rooted in the word of God. We thank you that your spirit will be poured out on America. We yeah. thank you, Lord that it will be done in Jesus yes. mighty name. Yes, yes. Amen. Yes, yes. And I just, I feel as there's a word right now, the Lord says, and this is a, yes. it's a, it's a fascinating uh, double-edged sword. The Lord is saying that do not think that the Lord is angry with you. The Lord is actually doing a deeper work of the probe of the spirit, the sword and the word yes. in the hearts of those that are listening right now. Yes. Because it, and what the Lord showed me is, as you allow the 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 sword of the word to uh, prune in your life those things that are not fruitful yes. and not that are that have been made a priority that are not priorities, something will happen as you go into the sobriety of what the Lord is saying. Yes. You will have a corresponding yes. joy that you will almost wonder if it's a frivolous disposition. Because the Lord says, as you go closer and deeper in the walk with him that will judge those things that are not profitable and order your steps according to his will, you will find joy and peace multiplying. And it will be as though you're happier and more carefree the more serious you are about walking with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Wow. <laughs> I felt the shock wave on that one. Yeah, I, the Lord just showed it to me. He said, "Look, I'm not. To, let him know. I'm not. I'm not upset. I'm not. Nope. This isn't an angry. This isn't the plague, angry God. This is the Lord saying, if my people can hear me, yes, I'm going to deliver you from you, and then you're going to have joy and peace like you've not had, and you're going to start to enjoy walking with me at a whole new level. And I do believe that's the awakening, Mara. And I pray that the that's arena, it. the tent meetings, are going to be filled for you. The signs and wonders will overflow." that there'll be the uh, Puff Graham moment in media. And even if you are, uh, 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 they come against you like they've done with David Wilkerson and others, that it's only going to give you a greater platform and that the Christian nationalists, those that love America, that the Lord says wear the badge with honor because it's going to be the badge that's going to give you a higher platform to speak what God wants you to speak so that America can be saved. Wow. <laughs> Hallelujah. Fire and glory, folks. Get that book right now. Order it right now. Get him to autograph it for you. All right. Thank you, my brother. I look forward to uh, seeing you and may this, may this, the word go flying right now. Thank you, my friend. Anytime, anytime you call me. Bless you. Brother. God bless you. Hi, I'm Lance Wallnow, but you already know that. What you don't know is you can subscribe and get another video. And I encourage you to do that right now. Just do it now while the moment's here. Just press that subscribe button and go for it.